that's just really, um, really fascinating. You brought up in gold, you brought up, you know, ancient culture. And uh, one of the things I really liked about Ingold's book, Lines, is he asked and answered a question that was the basis, one of the bases for the book, which is when did music lose its voice? You know, he talked about up until the early medieval period, you didn't have music without vocals, without lyrics, without voice. And when the notational practices for recording sound became robust enough, comprehensive enough, then you, then music or sound could kind of separate out and become an object of its own inquiry. And it's interesting to look at what you guys are talking about because in a way it seems like now the notational practices which are embedded within a computational environment have become even more radically robust and sophisticated to the point where we're kind of going going somewhere even beyond sound or you know if you're talking about how sound now is part of an, an embodied worlded kind of creation i'm just wondering if there's anything that you could talk about in that context you know the, the technology is really fundamentally changing even what we think of as music now again uh couldn't agree more um one of uh one of my peccadillos is the term multimodality one of the reasons i don't like it is because it assumes that there's modality, and then you have to put them together. Actually, it's the reverse. What you have is an immersive, evocative environment that you engage, and then from there, through forms of attention or other work, you pick out the particular modality. Huh. So, in other words, the field has already put the cart before the horse, and now we're trying to push back Really, that's a symptom of how we had already picked and chosen from our lot there one particular reality, narrow bandwidth, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, part of what you seem to be talking about is. Oh, uh, Dave is going on. That's okay. Should I, do you want me to stop? Did you want to add something, Mike? No, no, go ahead. I thought you did. Okay. You're fine. Well, I'll, I'll fit it in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm looking at your piece in Kairos, and in the intro you also say, new media cultures reached a point that one can compose on a laptop, sample loop, produce mashups, and thereby create heretofore unknown musics. I, I, you know, maybe this speaks a little bit to my kind of lack of knowledge of music, but it just seems like mashups are a really big thing um, these days. Um, maybe there's a legacy related back to collage and montage, a kind of avant-garde form of invention and creativity, but like, I guess, are mashups an important thing right now, or do you see that as an important engine for innovation in other areas like, you know, composition studies proper? Well, I, I think about the, the gray album. You know, it's the white album being mixed. It's. I always think of that that moment. Um, I don't know if the mashup is as powerful right now as it was when we were when we were doing the, the piece. Uh, but I still do think about. Um, oh, what's the DJ from Pittsburgh who's making uh, new music out of. Uh, snippets of the old um, and then it's become a parlor game to try and figure out what song is being sampled and where this piece came from and where this this other piece came from um, and I think in that way he's so, sort of mastered that part of the, the mashup but I, I keep going back again and again to um, cultural rebellion and resistance and thinking about the ways in which uh, I always use the shorthand pop we itself. Each of these forms of music is revolutionary, it's going to destroy culture, and everyone's afraid of it for about five minutes. And so hip hop, the mashup, remix, you know, remix is going to bring about the downfall of uh, um, the regime of um, uh, copyright. You know, that's artists who are learning how to use mashup are creating whole new markets 
and creating whole new genres of music. And so to try and cr uh, hold on to control and to commercial uh, uh, limits is ridiculous. And so now you're seeing backlashes on uh, artists who are holding too tightly to control are getting fan backlashes. You know, but to go back, hip hop was so revolutionary in so many different ways. And you mentioned Cirque. And so what he did, what Cirque did to talk about that composition, we feel like we're, we're adding to that tradition. And Cirque is talking about adding to the tradition of composition that went back to, uh, to rock and roll and to really take seriously rock and roll composition and then to take hip hop composition seriously, to take remix composition seriously. If composition had been big when bebop was the scary uh, uh, revolutionary music, uh, we would have had pieces about bebop and about, you know, the, the crazy improvisational music that you're doing. You know, you started talking about musical notation. But all of these things get consumed and get rearticulated and familiarized and naturalized, renaturalized, and denuded of any rebellious or revolutionary potential over and over and over again. And I think the, the key element is understanding when that moment is where it's at the peak of cultural impact and finding a way to participate in it. And so I, that's, that's why I think I continue to go back to punk and post-punk. Uh, and uh, I'll leave that to Thomas to talk about his prog interests. <laughs> I was going to... I was going to talk about a little different. I was going to talk about how uh, the mashup is like a very visible um, example of something that's always been true. Perhaps I'm becoming more aware of it. And that is inter integration of any form of music or form of expression uh, with technology. And so we're looking at that intersection as well. I mean, take somebody like Frank Sinatra considered perhaps the greatest single voice in the 20th century. And we tend to think, well, he developed that. Sinatra came up with that. His, his crooning style that is indelible for the age. But actually, he was only able to develop that with advances in microphone technology that can pick up the more subtle vocalisms. Huh. You have microphone technology if you don't have Sinatra. Huh. And so the mashup speaks to a, the capabilities of a certain technological age. Uh, perhaps it's kind of hot because uh, copyright law is so tight, which gives it a slight uh, rejon of rebellion to, to do that. Yeah. But what's also important here, I think, is to move out of a sense of adaptation. That artists are adapting to their technological environment. I think that's the standard. I think we need a term like exaptation so that we have a kind of an uh, ecological and evolutionary spiral where every advance creates new conditions of possibility that people build out of. Mm -hmm. So the mashup may still have a certain cachet, but for how long? New things are going to emerge out of what that new alternative makes possible. Mm -hmm. And so of embracing, but also forms of that mm -hmm. Well, and I want to go back to further and talk about you know the end of the Civil War. Suddenly you have all these martial instruments spread all over the South. And you have a new class of people who are picking up these instruments and are getting together into groups, playing a new music that reflects an African heritage and a South, uh, an American South that feeds into this Delta Blues mentality, which is what the Rolling Stones were coming over looking for as authenticity. But you have an entire uh, musical style unique in the world, the American jazz, that comes out of the end of the Civil War and these instruments being scattered. And so what, is, what was the word that you're suggesting? Exaptation? Exaptation. E-X. Exaptation, where you get folks who are picking up these instruments and who are 
pleasing themselves first with music. And then it gets picked up and distributed and we get this tradition of American blues and American jazz that comes out of the availability of instruments mm -hmm. and these martial forms that are so key to that development of Dixieland jazz. I mean, you could hear the martial beats in mm -hmm. some of these early recordings. And then it spreads up the Mississippi, you get St. Louis, St. Ian, all different styles of blues, Memphis blues, Memphis jazz that come out of that, of that uh, tradition of that ecological, these were things that were available. What do we do with it? How do we make these things make sense to us? Mm -hmm. in the context in which we're making them? So we say things like Frank Sinatra, cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listening to you guys for the last five plus minutes, it's, it's exciting. It's really inspiring to hear what you're saying. And I'm just, I found myself wondering, you know, if, if I were a grad student and I want to make up, I want to make a band now after listening to you guys, you know, what kind of band is that going to be? I mean, in other words, how, how could you guys help me as a grad student think in really new ways about what it means to be in composition studies? Like, if you want to put it in the context of a grad course, I mean, if I'm not supposed to talk anymore, meaning just write about someone else, then what am I actually doing, inspired by what you all are talking about? Well, certainly forms of engagement and production that uh, we're only now discovering. Some of them may work with new media, but why would all of them? I mean, we've got mobile technologies, which you yourself are already talking a great deal about. Uh, we've only scratched the surface there. Well, let me, let me, so let me ask this kind of follow-up question directly related to that. I, I kind of feel like oftentimes when we try to do stuff like that from our discipline, it's difficult because that's the purview of another discipline. You know, for example, if I want to do an immersive environment, I'm either playing into computer science or art and design. So, like, you know, how do we tell a grad student who really wants to do that kind of engagement that they're being comp they're, they're they're in composition studies when they do it? Like, I, you know, it seems like there's a difficulty in a disciplinary structure of being innovative. Well, one of the things that I, I always describe this piece as a gateway. Jeff Sirks was a gateway for me. Uh, the tag mimix piece, uh, and it, it helped me to understand what rhetoric and what composition was at the, at the dawn of the 21st century. And so in hearing what you're saying, I, I'm not so much concerned with what composition becomes or what we can do. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is a great chirotic moment. It's the 20th anniversary of, of this journal. When we started putting it together, I was asked all the time as a grad student, what are you doing this for? Your time should be spent on producing an essay for 3C, or yeah. time should be spent producing an essay for an established print journal. And what I said was, you know, I'm, I'm learning so much from doing this. It doesn't really matter what the outcome is. And I know Thomas was, was a big part of creating uh, enculturation and um, electrolyte came out of that same time with, with Victor's uh, group down in Arlington at the time. You know, there was so much excitement and I was much less worried about what I'm going to do with this or how this is going to become a career and much more attuned to what am I learning, how am I learning it, what is it going to become? We only make sense of things in hindsight anyway. And so now it seems inevitable that Kairos, Kairos would be continuously publishing for 20 years. Every year for 20 years, that has never been certain. Yeah. And so, you know, what, we were, what were we doing when we were trying to do this? We were trying to give ourselves opportunities that weren't available any other way. 
what were we doing when we were making this piece? I, I don't know that we're ever entirely sure of what that could be. But I know that... That's the ambient moment. Yeah, I was, I was enjoying it, and I was learning from it, and it enabled me to think about things in new and fresh ways, and in ways that I hadn't been able to before. So if someone came to me and said, you know, I want to do this, or I want to be in a band, or I want to make music, or, I would say, okay, that's great. But then the rhetorical challenge is, and this, I think this contradicts the alphabetic to a little bit, but how do you explain or what argument do you use for why this is an important engagement or a valid way of, of working through uh, this, that, the, the, this material? How does this contribute? And that's, I think that's the real thing about making knowledge. When we are most unsure, when we are most insecure, when we're dangling, that's when we're making, that's when we're making knowledge. And sometimes it's a complete failure, but history has a way of pairing those things away. And the flip side of that would be this great quote from Al Alfred North Whitehead. He says, knowledge doesn't keep any better than fish. So yes, we're making new knowledge. It's not going to lay around for you. Yeah. you got to keep making it. Yeah. All right.